I'm the senior web technologist at University of Mary Washington. And what that really means is webmaster, but my boss hates the term webmaster. Um, so I got a long, fancy title instead. Um, I am in charge of pretty much all development on the University of Mary Washington website. Uh, we have, uh, for the, the most part, for our public web presence, we have what's known as a multi-network instance of WordPress. And what that means is that in addition to multi-site, we've actually got multiple multi-sites running off of a single installation of WordPress. Um, it has its pros and cons, and we're actually in the process of kind of decoupling some of that to make it a little easier to manage. Uh, I freelance for various small businesses, colleges, nonprofits, those sorts of things, um, and I evangelize WordPress. Uh, in the multi-network install at UMW, we have 53 separate networks, uh, 344 total sites across those multi-site installations, and at this point, 115 separate active plugins, um, 36 of them network activated. We have our top level multi-site in a separate installation. We've got 24 separate sites set up in there right now, and last I checked, there were 61 plugins on there. So you can see we're not afraid of plugins, uh, at least at UMW. So um, at UMW, we also have what's known as UMW Blogs, which is a self-serve blogging platform for staff, faculty, and students at the, at the university. Uh, they can just sign up and create their own site. Um, you know, and actually how we got into WordPress as our main content management system at the university is we had an old clunky implementation of contribute with a database back end and all of our departments started defecting from our official system to UMW blogs to set up their own department sites there. So we figured if everybody's already using WordPress, why not make it official? So that's how we got there. And then the university also has a, uh, they started a program about two years ago called Domain of One's Own. And what that is, is it's a system where every incoming freshman gets their own shared hosting space and their own domain name. They get to choose whatever their domain name is. Um, and it's used to help them learn how to develop their own uh, online identity. Uh, they create e-portfolios and things like that, and the majority of them are using uh, WordPress within that. They're, they're installing other things as well, but they're using WordPress as the main front end uh, you know, display area for their personal domains. So as I mentioned, higher ed uses WordPress. Um, we keep hearing, or at least I do, I keep hearing multiple people saying that higher ed is the next vertical for WordPress. That's the thing that WordPress is going to break into next. And I'm here to tell you, don't call it a comeback. We've been here for years. <laughs> so how does higher ed use WordPress? Well, as I mentioned, we do use it for blogging. And that's pretty much the way it started. Um, Back around 2005, there were quite a few different schools that started running their own blogs off of WordPress. 2007 is when UMW blogs launched. Um, and at this point, there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of sites set up on UMW blogs. Um, so I mean, we're using it for blogging. Whether that's student blogging, whether that's faculty blogging or staff blogging, we're using it for blogging. Um, and each school is using it differently. Some of them have hand-chosen bloggers that they're using. They've got you know, 10 blogs set up and they've chosen the student bloggers that are, gonna, that are gonna post about what they're doing at the school. Other schools like UMW are just allowing anybody and everybody to sign up and create their own blog. But we're all, you know, a large portion of schools are using WordPress for blogging. And at this point, pretty much any school that's supporting blogging in some way the majority of them are using WordPress. They've all moved away from the other systems that they were using. We use it for news and magazines. Um, Vanderbilt is a great example of this. They do a lot of work with their news. Their central news repository is built on WordPress. They're using a separate content management system for their website, but it all feeds into a WordPress website for their news portal. So. Um, magazines as well, we all have these offices, well, the majority of us have these offices where we've got you know, anywhere from five to 15 people working on a print alumni magazine that goes out three or four times a year. Um, and then they wanna put that magazine on the web and a lot of us are using WordPress to put that magazine on the web. 
We're using it for department sites. As I mentioned, that's kind of how we got into WordPress in the first place at UMW, is that everybody was moving away from our official CMS and into WordPress. Department sites are being set up all across the world with WordPress, and it's because they can set it up themselves, they can manage it themselves. It's funny, a lot of times you'll even find department sites are set up on WordPress.com because it was free and easy to set up. So they went out and set it up, and they just got somebody to put a link to it on the official website somewhere for the university. So. And then there are a lot of schools using it for the top level. Um, the, you know, and what that means for those of you that aren't familiar with the structure of higher ed, higher ed websites are a beast unlike any other. Um, we use 40,000 pages to do what we could do in 1,000. Um, and we have, as I said, you know, we have 350 sites, separate sites set up just to present basically our public web presence at the university. And we're not a huge university. Um, you know, we're four to 5,000 full-time undergraduate students, which is not humongous. Um, but we have that many sites because uh, within higher education, there are a lot of politics, there are a lot of silos, and people will do, you know, people want to be able to control their own small portion of the web. And so as part of that, uh, you can sometimes end up with a somewhat decentralized model in higher ed. And so the top level sites would be like if you were to go to the home page of the university and there would be a handful of pages or potentially even a handful of sites that branch off of that home page that are all managed, you know, pro for the most part managed centrally within a central office and a lot of schools are using WordPress to present their top level sites there. It's not necessarily an official content management system because once again, politics. Um, you don't necessarily have an official content management system at a lot of schools, but they're still using it to present those top level sites. And then you also find that they're using it in a lot of areas for divisional and department sites as well. It's just not any official claim there. And then, of course, there are places like University of Mary Washington that are using it for the whole site. Everything we put on the web, you know, at least 99% of things we put on the web are managed through WordPress in some way or another. There are schools using it as a front end for wikis, because really, who likes the design of media wiki sites? <laughs> um, so there are places like University of British Columbia up in Canada where they manage a lot of content for, especially like help documentation and things like that. They manage it through something like Wikimedia, and then they display it in a template through WordPress. They're pulling it into WordPress, and what they're able to do is they're able to pull in pieces of that wiki into various places where it makes sense throughout their help documentation that's presented through WordPress. We use it to run and manage courses. Um, you know, and that, that is another beast all in itself. Um, that can mean something as simple as, uh, you know, we're just posting assignments up there, or it could mean something as complicated as a, you know, the, the uh, epitome of a MOOC, a massively open online course, is something like DS106 which is, uh, it's a course that's, that's presented in part by University of Mary Washington in partnership with a lot of other schools throughout the world. Um, and what it is, is it, I mean, it really is a huge open online course. It's managed through WordPress. The assignments are posted through WordPress. The assignments are actually, you know, the, the projects that the students do are posted through WordPress and shared through WordPress. They're shared through Twitter and Facebook and Tumblr and Pinterest and everything else. Um, and, and a lot of it comes back to WordPress and it's all presented through that interface. Um, but again, it can also be something as simple as just a professor posting their assignments on WordPress. Um, but again, it's that's, you know, WordPress is being used for all of the, you know, all of the various areas within that gamut. We're using it for living documents and open textbooks. Um, at James Madison University, I know they have at least one instance where they have a class that develops the textbook as part of, you know, their class is, you know, part of the class is actually developing the textbook 
as a WordPress site, a blog essentially, and then the next semester the, the class uses that textbook and starts to develop their own through WordPress. And so it's an actual living textbook built out of WordPress. Um, you know, and again, there are a lot of other places that are just the, the instructors are creating their textbooks through WordPress. It makes it easy to manage. It makes it easy to publish. It makes it easy to share. And so all of these courses, instead of having to go and buy a $150 textbook at the bookstore, they just have to show up to this website and they can find all of the information they need for that class. We're using it to build communities. Um, these are a few examples on this slide of different communities that are being built through WordPress. Uh, I put Temple at the top because you know they're like right next door, so you know figured I'd give them a shout out. Um, if you attended David Bissett's section, session yesterday about BuddyPress, a lot of these are BuddyPress communities. Um, and they're set up using WordPress and BuddyPress to allow students or faculty or you know, whoever the community is to communicate with each other, to work with each other, to build different materials through the system and then share it out. Uh, oh, and actually, just a quick note about BuddyPress. Um, a lot of the core work on BuddyPress was actually done and it's still being done to a certain extent by people involved in higher education. CUNY Commons, which is City University of New York, um, they build a whole lot of stuff revolving around BuddyPress. So. Using it for digital signage and presentations. Um, John Carroll University, they are a Jesuit university in Cleveland, I believe. Uh, they're using it for the majority of their digital signage across campus. So when you, know, when you see advertisements for the next meeting of the chess club, or you see the weather at the bottom of the television screen in the, com you know, in the, in the student commons, or even when you see emergency notifications, those are all powered through a somewhat custom WordPress theme that they've built there at John Carroll University. It's being broadcast through a web server across all of the large TVs across campus. Uh, this presentation right here that I'm giving right now is built through Reveal.js using a WordPress uh, backend to create and manage the content. So, um, and if you see, and it, you know, at the end of the presentation, there'll be a slightly larger link you can follow to this presentation. And within the presentation, there's a link to that plugin on GitHub. So you can play with it and test it out. And my mouse went away from, the... there we go. Um, as I mentioned, domain of one's own. Uh, University of Mary Washington started it, but quickly a lot of other universities started to pick it up, especially if it, after it was featured in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, but very quickly, almost immediately after we announced we were doing that, uh, Oberlin started to look into it. Um, and eventually, I think somewhat recently, not like within the last week or anything, but somewhat recently, Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma picked it up and started doing it themselves. They call it OU Create. And the, on this slide is a quote from their, their frequently asked questions. The most popular OU Create use case are websites and blogs created with WordPress. So even though they're being given shared hosting space that they can do anything with, the first thing they're doing is installing WordPress. And it's used for just about anything else you can think of in higher education. You've got microsites, you've got web apps, you've got learning management systems. There was a presentation yesterday about building out courses with WordPress. Um, you know, you've got uh, ScholarPress and LearnPress and Courseware and a ton of other learning management system plugins and systems built around WordPress and schools are using them. They're not using, the, they haven't adopted them quite the way that the enterprise systems have been adopted, but they're playing with them and they're learning them and they're starting to set them up. Got event and resource management and ticket sales. Um, you can, you know, again, we're, we're presenting our entire events calendar on the University of Mary Washington website with WordPress. Uh, it's actually, in our case, at this point, it's built out of a premium plugin called Timely, which is uh, the premium version of all-in-one event calendar. 
Um, but it's all built into WordPress. It's built on a WordPress backend. And so we're managing all of our events that way. And the nice thing about the way we're doing that, and a lot of other schools are doing as well, is that our event managers, the people actually creating these events and trying to publicize them, can manage those events in just about any interface they want. And we can pull it in and present it through WordPress. So a lot of our event people are managing their calendars through Google Calendar, but we can still pull it into Timely to the all-in-one event, excuse me, into the all-in-one event calendar and massage the data, add tags to it, depending on which Google Calendar it came from, and then display it in the right places. Uh, E-portfolios, as I mentioned, that's a big use case for Domain of One's Own at UMW, is the e-portfolios. Uh, we have a few success stories already. I know one of the very first sites created on Domain of One's Own was by a young woman at University of Mary Washington who, using that e-portfolio that she built through UMW Domains, she was able to get a job at uh, PBS immediately out of college. She's doing a lot of digital media work for PBS. Uh, conference sites. We love conferences in higher education. We go to conferences, we run conferences, we uh, talk about conferences, we have conferences about conferences, um, and we build a lot of those sites using WordPress. Uh, I just went to a conference last month called EDUI down in Charlottesville, Virginia, and that entire site is built out of WordPress. Um, there's a, an organization called Hi Ed Web. Some of you have probably, you know, if you're in higher ed, some of you have probably been to that conference. The, uh, all of the regional conferences they put on, those sites are built out through WordPress. Um, it makes it simple. And obviously, as we're aware here at WordCamp, WordCamp sites are built out of, of WordPress. Not that that's specifically within higher ed, but it's a conference site being built with WordPress. Uh, campus maps and tours. We love building campus maps and tours. We don't necessarily make them useful, um, but we love building them and we love making them look pretty. Um, and one of the things we've been able to do a lot recently is start to build out campus maps through WordPress. There's a great plugin, um, you know, it still needs some work, but there's a great skeleton for a plugin in the repository by a guy named Gabe Nagme. It's a plugin called Placemarks, and it's built to allow you to manage placemarks within a Google map. Uh, within WordPress. And what you can do actually with that plugin is you can either plug in latitude and longitude if you really want to, or if you're walking around with your phone that has location data, you can just press a button in the WordPress dashboard and it knows where you are, it uses your location data and drops a pin on the map that you can then describe. He built that plugin to uh, allow them to build out an interactive map of all of the art installations across their campuses at Portland Community College. Um, and we're using it for policy and syllabus submission and organization. Oh man, do we have a lot of policies in higher education. <laughs> we have policies about policies about policies about committees um, and committees on those. But you know, we manage a lot of that content and a lot of those submissions through WordPress. At University of Mary Washington, we have a system built out for our provost where they can, you know, people can write up a, a policy within the template that's been provided to them. They submit it through a gravity form. It gets submitted to him. If he approves it, it automatically gets published on his page within the website so that people can then start to review it. They can comment on it with the WordPress comment system. Um, we can add all kinds of metadata to it in order to uh, decide whether or not it's going to pass as an official policy or whether or not it's going to go back for review or changes or anything like that. And, you know, really, WordPress goes to infinity and beyond within, within higher education. So how do we configure WordPress within higher ed? Um, pretty much the way you guys would with just about anything else. We've got self-hosted, we've got managed WordPress hosting, we've got dedicated servers, shared hosting, standard LAMP systems, Varnish and Nginx proxy caches, and even some people running on IIS because for whatever reason, and you know, I'll make this point again later uh, you know, near the end of the presentation, but for whatever reason within higher education, just like in major enterprise, we really like our Windows systems 
and we really like our enterprise systems. So the next thing you'll find is that in addition to setting up a lot of multi-site and multi-network, because that goes back to the politics and, and, and the silos and how everybody wants their own little piece of the sky, um, we also do a lot of single sign-on. So again, we're not just talking about enterprise here, we're talking about higher education, where everything's got to go through single sign-on. Our central IT needs to manage user accounts for everything that runs across campus for the most part. And so you'll find a lot of different single sign-on systems for WordPress that have, built, that have been built by higher education. If you search for CAS in the WordPress plugin repository right now, I think you'll get about eight results and probably about seven of those were built by people within higher education. Aggregation. We love pulling in information. It's perfect for working with uh, a lot of faculty like to pull in their information from across the web about here's a paper I published here, here's another paper I published here, those sorts of things. WordPress is great for aggregation and we use it for that a lot. Um, we also tend to set up version control. Um, you know, at that point it's a matter of uh, accountability. It's a matter of us being able to see who did what when um, and what changes were made so that when someone comes back three months later and says this link is, been, you know, is missing from my page or my page is just a white screen, we can go back and look through and see how that happened because it does happen. Um, and we build a lot of feature themes and plugins. But for the most part, higher ed will share them. They will publish them if they are things that can be used by other people. Uh, for instance, um, Better WP Security was built while Chris Wegman was working at Southern Illinois University. Um, it was started there, essentially. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, there, there are a lot of plugins that are built through higher ed, from higher ed, that are published in the repository. Um, and if we're not publishing them in the repository, we're still sharing them. Pretty much all of our GitHub repositories and everything else are open for other people to play with because things may be specific to our institution, but that doesn't mean you can't go through and change it to work with your institution. And the common challenges we face, account control and pruning, quality control, of course performance and security, and those, we do face performance and security issues, and again, it's not necessarily WordPress core, but we're, you know, for the most part, we do use a lot of feature themes and plugins, and so we face those potential issues, but we also face the public perception of those issues. Um, especially, there are a lot of central IT departments that are very concerned. Uh, you know, they think we have to use Drupal or we have to use an enterprise system because they've heard in the last 10 years that WordPress had some sort of security problem. Um, and we face resource issues. You know, there's never enough staff, there's never enough money. So we end up having to do a lot of things ourselves, build a lot of things out in our free time. Yeah, free time. So, um, why does higher ed use WordPress? The same reasons anyone else does. Cost, flexibility, the support and documentation are fantastic. And most of all, it's the openness. The open source community-driven philosophies behind WordPress dovetail very nicely with the sharing, educational, open experience of higher education. And so with that, I'll open the floor to questions. Somebody's got to have a question. I got a free T-shirt if somebody's got a question. <laughs> yeah. Hey there. Hello. Um, I have a, actually more of a comment. Sure. Um, so I was at UMW in 2007, um, mm -hmm. and we began using the UMW blogs. And it was fascinating um, throughout the course of our education how um, having that alongside of our courses created ongoing discussions outside of class time. Um, and then we saw an entire crew of English majors release into the workforce and begin solving communities pro or company and organizations problems um, with WordPress, wow. which was not expected. <laughs> and this, right. was, um, this was even a couple of years ago, which things are moving quickly and it was just fascinating seeing that happen. So thanks for what you did. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Here, let's see. I have oh. a t-shirt for you. <laughs> and I also work at a university, and I'm wondering, um, one of the big challenges, you mentioned this a little bit, the kind of 
everybody wants to go their own direction uh, sort of aspect. How do you enforce security and, and uh, stability among, you know, different departments, different units, choosing their own themes, plugins, et cetera? Or is, it, is that very closely managed? Um, well, it's a different philosophy at every school. Within UMW, we centrally manage that for the public web presence. Now, UMW Blogs is a different story. UMW Blogs is a sandbox where, for the most part, they can play with whatever they want to play with. For the public web presence at University of Mary Washington, we manage that centrally. Uh, we will test and review plugins before we'll install them. We'll make sure we don't already have that same functionality duplicated somewhere else. Um, and we're using a single theme across the system for the public web presence. So we manage that centrally and we version control all of that stuff. And, and like I said, we test and review plugins. So. Well, have you, I know you've worked with lots of other universities. Have, do you, have you seen other, have you seen approaches to kind of rein that in? Or you know, we use uh, yeah. cPanel to, mm -hmm. to actually have the PHP execution a little bit uh, controlled in different mm -hmm. puddles, but uh, so one person hopefully can't crash the entire Right. Entire ball of wax, but uh, lots and lots of different themes. Uh, you know, the, the cry is always academic freedom. We want to do what we want to do because it's academic freedom. <laughs> that doesn't mean you should have a plugin that that crashes everything. But you know, again, they're faculty, I'm just staff, so they win. Right. Um, I have seen quite a few universities adopt official approved plugin lists similar to the way managed WordPress hosting will do. So like WP Engine has their own list of disallowed plugins. I've seen universities and colleges do the same thing. They build lists of disallowed plugins. Or I believe um, Jeremy Felt from University of Washington said they have a white list of plugins they allow. It's not just a black list of plugins they don't allow. They just have a specific list of plugins they do allow. Um, I could be wrong, I could be misquoting him, but I believe that's what he said before. Um, so, I mean, you'll see, you'll see a few different approaches to it, but yeah, a lot of it is a matter of kind of trusting your gut, trusting the WordPress community, finding the things that, sh that, that are safe to use, and kind of making those, not, and, and certainly with faculty, it tends to be a situation where you want to tell them why that's going to be better for them as opposed to telling them why they can't do what they thought they wanted to do in the first place. Um, so it's, it's a matter of the approach towards how you, you, know, how you get, get those kinds of things done um, with the staff and, and with the official you know, WordPress system, I mean with the official university system and stuff like that, you can use policies and things like that to enforce when it comes to faculty, especially like faculty blogs and stuff like that, you tend to want to sell them on why it's better for them to do it a different way. Excellent. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Here, you can have a shirt too. That's all the shirts I got though. So, whoops, sorry. I got buttons though. Anyway. I'll take a button. Okay. Um, I do a lot of WordPress sites for different departments within a university, within a big university, and I find that um, they're not really set up well for working with outside contractors. And I wonder if that's something that you do at your university and what kind of ways that you do that make it a little easier to work with the university processes. Because it's much different, of course, than working on your own. Right. Well, and you're absolutely right. And, and again, that's another thing that higher ed shares a lot with large enterprise systems is that, again, for the security purposes, and it's not real security. It's what, you know, it's what the, you know, the, the specific C, uh, you know, C information security officer thinks about security. But for security purposes, everything's locked down and nobody has access to anything. Um, and, you know, and it's certainly something I face as a freelancer as well that, you know, because again, I do a lot of consulting with universities across the country where, you know, you build it out and you've got to send a package off to their central IT to install it for you. And God forbid you should need to make a change afterwards. Exactly. Um, so at UMW, um, we, we do have situations, at least within our university, we have situations where there are vendors that we've granted. FTP access to and things like that um, so that they can get in the system and make the changes that they need to. We also have, you know, we have a completely separate staging server set up at University of Mary Washington so that we can, we can give them access to that to get things built out, test them out, and then we can just pull it off of the staging server and into, into production. Um, so we're able to have a little more leeway as far as that goes. But for small department sites and things like that, for the most part, they're not going to have 
the power over central IT that the central marketing office will. So they're not going to be able to grant those sort of permissions, unfortunately. And you're lucky if you can even get them to configure WordPress correctly so that you can install plugins and themes without having to have them upload through FTP. And again, unfortunately, that's a lot of those, those mythos that go around security that they think they're making things more secure by locking them down, but really they're making it less secure by, you know, making it so things can't be done properly. But, so I'm sorry I don't have a solution. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there are some universities, especially when, they, when you're working with the central marketing office that have the power to say, no, we really need this vendor to have access to these sorts of things. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think this will probably be the last question. Go ahead. OK. I, uh, I work at Boston University, and we've got WordPress deployed at a pretty large scale. Yes, you do. About 80% of our web properties, yeah. So um, one of the things that, that becomes really interesting is the, when we have to deploy updates to core. Mm -hmm. um, how do you guys handle that? Because I know that's always been an interesting topic for us. Yeah. Um, so again, <clears throat> we have a staging server. Um, and we will test over and over and over again on our staging server before we, we actually release updates on production. Um, in the past, when we were internally hosted, we were, we were pretty well able to keep those things in sync, and we were able to install updates pretty easily. Um, you know, in fact, nine times out of ten, after we ran a good backup and we tested it on staging, I'd press the update button within the WordPress dashboard, which is how, you know, confident I was in that process. Um, with our new hosting arrangement, it's not set up in a way that we can do that anymore. And unfortunately, we've actually had a few situations where even after testing successfully five or six times in staging, we've gone to a fatal error in production. Um, so, you know, the, I guess, ultimately, our process is back up, run the update, and if it doesn't work, you know, roll back. Um, again, for us, everything's run on virtual servers, so we can have our vendor capture a snapshot of the entire system before we run the update. So if we need to roll back, they can just roll back the, the virtual server rather than us having to go in and manually roll back WordPress. Um, but at, at that point, it's all about the backups more than it is about you know, actually figuring out how to run the updates. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, when I do need to run updates, Depending on which system I'm using, I'll either put it all in Git and put, you know, push it from a Git repository to our system, or I'll just do it through old-fashioned SFTP. I'll upload all the packages, unzip them, and move them to the right places. So, you know, and again, I think Git is going to be huge for a lot of us in the, in the coming days. Um, it's not widely adopted for running those sorts of updates yet. Um, but there are some schools that are doing that very successfully. I think uh, at Lafayette, Charles, you could probably speak to this uh, as a sidebar. They're doing a lot of great work with, with versioning their entire WordPress system with Git. So he'd be, he's behind you. He'd be the one to talk to. Yeah, we, we have a lot of it in Git. A lot of it's still in subversion, but we do deploy everything from a version-controlled system. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's, it's a pretty good process. There. Yeah, yeah. And that, it's, it's coming for a lot of people. It's just not as widely adopted as it should be at this point. So. Yeah. The headache for us mostly is around the testing. It takes a, a couple months to go run through. We've got oh, wow. um, a couple hundred themes that are in place. We've got all the plugins. So just making sure all that, that those themes yeah. we built 10 years ago. Right. And I would say a lot of that comes down to depending on, A, how important it is and how vocal the people are. For the most part, what we'll do is we'll run the update. And if somebody, if somebody screams at us because something broke, we'll look into it and potentially get it fixed. Um, in other cases, we tell them, I'm sorry, you're using 10-year-old code. You've really got to get up, to the, you know, get up with the times or it's going to continue to be broken. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you.